So our next speaker is uh, Jennifer Giacconi Cruz. She's visiting from Germany, and she's a psycholinguist and a language technologist and Japanologist. Yeah. <laughs> and she, <laughs> she'll be talking about in passing the intermediate level in language learning. It's all yours, Jennifer. Oh, thanks, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm really happy to see you all here. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here at my first Langfest. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, <laughs> and I'm honored to share this talk with you today because it's the first time that I'm giving it. And I hope that it's um, a topic that will have enough interest that I can give it again elsewhere, um, and maybe with updates. So um, once um, this talk is through, I would really love to have your feedback. And there will be a link at the end of the talk where you can contact me and give me feedback about the topics that you've seen, things that I missed that you would like to see more of, um, and anything else that you would like to see updated so that next time I give this talk, it will be even more informative. Um, so yeah, um, so thanks again for coming. Um, it's about moving beyond the middle, um, how to get out of the intermediate desert. Um, and I call it an intermediate desert because as you can see in the picture here, and this picture is provided by Shedworks Games. Um, it's for a game that's coming out soon that I absolutely fell in love with the visuals of it and they told me that I could use it. Um, it's exciting, it's expansive, it makes you feel like a very small part of the world and you never know when it's going to end and it can feel exhilarating but it also can feel like a slow death. Um, so that's why I call it an intermediate desert. Um, there are a few other reasons why, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, we sort of went over this bit, but yeah, I'm a language technologist and psycholinguist, and I specialize in second language and multilingual acquisition. Um, so third languages, fourth languages. Um, I'm a member of the European Association for Japanese Studies, um, and I was a lecturer and a curriculum developer at the School of International Liberal Studies for Waseda University in Tokyo, Japan. So I spent a lot of time creating curriculums for intermediate language learners, um, and I found that um, um, it became actually a topic that I found was not really dealt with very directly. You see a lot of talk about intermediate level textbooks, intermediate level classes, intermediate level self-study, but you, when you really look at it closely, you realize that it's a bit superficial. And this is really what that talk's about. So this talk came about because it's personal. All that time I spent in the classroom with my students, watching them get discouraged, feeling the pain along with them because I myself had been an intermediate, and I still am. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to find a better way to get people to move beyond all of the scary stuff that comes with being an intermediate. Um, I also decided to do this talk because it's important. Intermediate language learners are the largest group by far of all of the different levels of language learners. Um, and as a language researcher and scientist, we need data about these learners. Um, if people don't talk about intermediate language learning, if they don't engage in activities that measure intermediate language learning, we don't have the data that we can use to help make better frameworks for learning, for giving better advice to students, for giving people materials to help themselves study during self-study kinds of activities. So it's important and it's relatable. Raise your hand if you are intermediate in any of your languages right now. Okay, let's just take a moment to look around, yeah? Okay, um, and I'm intermediate in most of my languages at the moment, so um, this is something we can all relate to. And even if you're not an intermediate, you were an intermediate, and you probably will be one again, because I'm pretty sure everybody is already thinking about the next language they want to learn. So this is something that as polyglots is especially a pain point, I would say. It's also a joy point because once you're in it and you really feel like everything's moving along, it can be such a wonderfully freeing experience. But when it's painful, ugh, it hurts. And I'm sure you can all agree. So let's talk about what is intermediate. I mean, we know this word, intermediate. We know it means middle, intermediate, right? It's kind of double-double. Um, but there's two ways of describing intermediate. There's the definition, which is very prescriptive. It's a framework. It's a very strict idea of what intermediate can be. And then there's the experience of being an intermediate. 
right? There's the feelings of being an intermediate. That's what happens in real life. Um, what by definition is described may not actually reflect real life conditions. And I'm gonna talk about those two gaps in a minute. So let's talk about the definition of intermediate to start with. Um, it's CEFR, the Common European Framework of Reference, um, levels B1 and B2. Um, some of you may be familiar with the CEFR, um, some of you may not. Um, some of us, as language learners, are obsessed with the CEFR, right? <laughs> and some of us actively avoid it. Personally, I think it's a great frame of reference, but I don't treat it as gospel. Um, I think the CEFR is really great for um, very large groups of learners or for people who don't have a reference for language learning. Um, for example, people who are trying to facilitate language learning but are not active learners or educators. But I think that as a learner, when we hang on to the CEFR too hard, it can be really discouraging because it's very prescriptive and it's a very standard definition of something. And I'm gonna come to that in a moment as to why that can be problematic. Um, and also by definition, we can say it happens approximately, notice the wavy equal sign, yeah, so approximately, I'm not saying this is a hard and fast number, around 200 hours of study. Could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less. It could be around 180. 180 is roughly, most research will put 180, 180 hours at when you start to leave the beginner's area and head towards intermediate. Um, but it could be as much as 220, 230, 240. It could be as little as 150. It really depends because guess what? One of the other reasons why this is such a difficult thing to pin down is because every learner is different. And every combination of learner and environment and learning method and motivation and whether you only slept two hours last night because you got hungover or <laughs> because you, for some reason, were really excited and you're totally focused, it could mean that one day you learn something really quickly and the next day it just will not get in your brain as much as you want it to. So these individual differences from person to person and from day to day and even from hour to hour can make it really difficult to pin down. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the CEFR, I thought I would take a moment because not everybody's into it. Um, the CEFR B1 is called a threshold or true intermediate learner. Um, and even that, I would say, is not exactly true. Um, it, often threshold or true intermediate learners are considered hard and fast intermediates. For example, when you buy a book that says it's geared toward intermediate learners, it's usually aimed for B1. Um, and this means you can understand the main points of clear standard input on familiar matters regularly encountered in work, school, or leisure. You can deal with most situations likely to arise while traveling in an area where the language is spoken. You can produce simple connected text on topics that are familiar, oh, that are familiar, um, let's see, oh, familiar of a personal interest, and you can describe experiences and events, dreams, hopes, and ambitions, and briefly give reasons and explanations for opinions and plans. Um, is anybody here at B1 in anything? Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, and, and B1's a great place to be. B1's a wonderful place to be because you're really starting to get momentum. This is the point where you really start to feel some confidence about coming up with stuff on your own, dealing with unfamiliar situations. This is where you really start to spread your wings and fly. Um, and then there's B2. And B2 is always that point in the distance you wanna go towards, right? Um, B2 is what's considered for a lot of people the integration level. Um, for example, as was mentioned before, I live in Berlin. Um, and in Germany, if you are trying to get your permanent residence, for example, or if you're trying to get a job in Germany, uh, Vanessa knows what I'm talking about. Um, you need to have B2 level in order to do this. Um, and they usually ask for a B2 certificate most of the time. And they say this is intermediate, but what they fail to say is that it's vantage of intermediate or what's often called more or less upper intermediate. Um, and you can understand the main ideas of complex text on both concrete and abstract topics, including technical discussions and field of specialization. Whoa, 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 whoa. From B1, where you can negotiate regular, everyday kinds of situations, let's, let's go back a slide, can understand the main points of clear standard input to including technical discussions in field of specialization. That's a pretty big gap, depending on what your field of specialization is. 
Um, and that's kind of the problem, the big gap there. You can interact with a degree of fluency and spontaneity that makes regular interaction with native speakers quite possible without strain for either party. Hmm, okay, what exactly does that mean? I'm not entirely sure. Can produce clear, detailed text in a wide range of subjects and explain a viewpoint on a topical issue giving advantages and disadvantages of various options. Personally, I try to do that myself anyway, um, <laughs> but even when I'm a beginner, but okay. Um, and I would, for me, the biggest problem between B1 and B2 is that there is quite a big step up. And this is one of the reasons why being an intermediate can be so frustrating. So what does that mean by experience? Well, speaking about the idea of being frustrating, by experience, being an intermediate looks a little bit like that, <laughs> right? You may have actually done this in your notebook when you've gotten frustrated with something, right? You're just, oh, forget it. Ugh. What it really explains is that it's, there's a lot of movement and passion behind that doodle there, isn't there? There's a lot of like joy and frustration. There's different colors. There's different pressures, textures. There's a lot of passion and momentum. And to me, that's what the being the intermediate and what the intermediate experience is like. Um, it can be really exciting, right? Uh, you're mastering new skills, you're realizing that something that was once difficult is now not so difficult, or you realize that a mistake that you continually made no longer exists for you, but it also can take forever. No one ever has said, being an intermediate will take exactly one year. <laughs> if they have, has anybody ever heard this? Because if you have, I want to know who you've been talking to. <laughs> but. It takes forever. You don't know when it's going to end. And for me, this is always the biggest thing. If somebody told me, for, uh, for example, I've been intermediate in Russian for oh, uh, 15 years now. <laughs> yeah. Um, if someone said to me, oh, Jen, you know, being intermediate in Russian, it'll take you 15 years, but it will end. I would say, OK, I can deal with that. I have the patience. I know when it's going to end. I'll just pace myself. I'll have something to look forward to every night after I've had a frustrating day of studying Russian. I'll be like, it's OK. I just got 14 more years left. <laughs> but I could do it. I have patience. I have stamina. I could get through it. Because in the end, I would know that I'd not be an intermediate anymore. But nobody ever said that to me. Nobody has ever said it to me. I don't think anybody ever will. I'm not even sure if I'm ever going to get out of intermediate, to be honest, which is fine with me. But it can take forever. And it's the not knowing when it's going to end. And I think that's always one of the hardest things for people to get over, or the hardest thing for people to sort of um, accept and use in a positive way. Um, and I think that's one of the things that is the, kind of the reason why being an intermediate can seem like such a frustrating time. But it can also be very gratifying. Again, um, when you find these small triumphs that you've sort of experienced, or one day you say something and you're like, oh, I actually just came out with that. And you think back to, wait, where did I even learn that? I don't remember. Where did that come from? But you know it's right. That's some of the best feelings that you can ever have when you're learning a language. But it can be frustrating. Think about all those grammatical errors that you just keep on making that never go away. I have loads of them, and I make them all the time, every single time. Even with German, a language that I speak every day, every once in a while, I have a second-guess error, where I had it right in my head, but then I second-guessed myself. And before I said it, I corrected myself into saying the wrong thing. So it can be very frustrating. Um, but it also means that it's the most insecure time. And I, when I say insecure, I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean it in a neutral way. I mean it in the sense that we just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when we're going to have that next moment of triumph. We don't know when we're going to have that next moment of wanting to bang our head into the desk because we just can't seem to get it right. And unfortunately, and the thing that breaks my heart the most as a language educator is that this is the point where we are most vulnerable for giving up. I see most of my students drop out of class at the intermediate level. And it's not the beginning intermediate level, it's that big gray area in between. Because remember, again, that intermediates are comprised of a group of people that are almost basically beginners or fresh out of the beginning group, all the way over to people who are pretty much almost advanced and everything in between. And it's this everything in between, this huge, huge, broad, wide, wide, wide like, area of diversity that means that we just don't know what to expect for ourselves. We don't know what to expect from teachers. We don't know what to expect from our 
learning materials. And that insecurity of not knowing what to expect is what makes it a really insecure time. And one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit is about expectations. So why is it called an intermediate desert? Well, again, potentially the largest level of group of learners. Um, and I, what I feel is kind of a bit strange is that when I went to go look for statistics and references to give you some hard numbers and data or metrics about demographics for intermediate language learners, I couldn't find any. <laughs> That's weird. I thought I was going to find some, at least some very crazy percentages, like one paper says 20% and another paper says 82%. I just didn't find any at all. And I went through piles and piles of research papers, and I went through all kinds of articles. I was looking at reports from the British Council. I couldn't find anything. And even if I did find something, it was more about saying, the group of intermediate learners is very large and diverse. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. Right? Um, so I find that really strange, and that's what kind of is bothering me, and that's one of the reasons why I decided to write this talk, is because it's the largest group of learners, but we have so little data about intermediate learners. And when we have so little data about intermediate learners, how can we improve it? There's diverse needs and goals. Again, think about that wide spectrum that I just illustrated for you. This wide spectrum means that you could have anything from still working on very basic grammar or learning the last of your basic vocabulary all the way up to, I need to learn this really obscure idiom that only gets used in very specific situations. So these diverse needs and goals mean that when you look at, for example, in language learning classes, they try to divide um, intermediates up into three or four levels so that you don't get a lower end intermediate up with a higher end intermediate. That's great, but then when it comes to the learning materials, it's not really matching in the same way. Um, and that often means that intermediates spend the most time supplementing their learning with other materials. And so it means a lot of legwork for the learner themselves. It means a lot of self-investment. You don't necessarily get it in class. You don't necessarily get it from your books and other materials. And you have to find these little techniques and ways to bridge it for yourself. Um, and it's a bit hacky, and it kind of feels like you're making quick fixes all the time. And that's also that can be really taxing for yourself, right? Um, and it's also personally influenced and self-actualized stage of learning. And again, this means that all of these tiny little triumphs that you have, all of these small little things that you start to do that you realize, hey, I'm finally doing it. This is really great. But learning is such an ego-orientated kind of activity as well. So every time that we do make a mistake or every time that we do realize that something's not working anymore, we can also feel disproportionately upset or discouraged by it. And especially in the intermediate level because there's so much potential for progress and we're not really sure how to gauge what we should expect to be normal progress. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as normal progress for an intermediate. Um, a professor of mine often said that being an intermediate language learner is like being the teenager of language learners. There's no normal, no two people are going to do it the same way. You're going to feel like, what are these feelings? I don't know what's happening to me. <laughs> And I guess she was right. Um, it really is like that. So um, that's another way to approach it when you start to sort of feel like you're losing your mind because you don't know why you can't remember that grammatical structure anymore. Just remember, OK, it's just like being a teenager again. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, one of the other problems is that the time investment can be big. It can be a really big time investment. Like I said, intermediate for 15 years now. <laughs> I don't know when it's going to end. Um, individual needs and effort. So this means that you have to spend a lot of time with yourself. Um, and then it's the most underserved group of terms of materials. Um, personally, I had the luxury of working with a language learning application for the last two years that was built, actually, unintentionally built for intermediates. Um, and so for me, that's one of the other reasons why this is kind of a very... Um, high visibility topic for me is because finally, as an intermediate learner myself, when I piloted the product, I really felt that it worked for me. And I really felt like, wow, OK, I'm actually making some progress here. And it was that feeling where I was like, oh, other intermediates need to feel this feeling more. So I thought to myself, OK, well, what other things are out there? And I started looking for other applications and other learning materials that were really well made for intermediates. 
And it's really hard to tell. There's nothing that actually markets itself towards intermediates aside from your traditional conventional learning materials for universities. So I suppose the other point that I want to make with this talk is to sort of just keep people in mind that it's not like you're missing something. It's just not out there, really. So what is this intermediate desert? Um, yes, you could be out there long enough that you have your bones <laughs> in the desert. I've, I don't know what kind of animal that, what language would that be? <laughs> um, around 200 hours of study. Um, and we have some very special issues as intermediate learners. And you may have, you may know these explicitly as the way I'm describing them, which is a bit more of a, um, a research way of describing them. Or you may realize now that this is what you're experiencing, but you've only felt it as a vague feeling. Um, and I'm going to outline some of these challenges that we have. Um, and again, not everybody faces these challenges. Every learner is different. Um, but we have receptive and active use. Um, there's a researcher named Krashen who in 1982 talked about receptive versus active use, as in like what you receive or as passive input and active use or active output. Um, and how that activates what you learn and what you retain in your memory. And I will be going into this a little bit more deeply in a moment. The fluency versus complexity gap. So for those of you who speak very fluently, but maybe your language is quite simple, or you speak very complex sentences, but your fluency isn't as smooth, what happens with that? What's the deal with that? Um, and how is that very uniquely frustrating for intermediates? Your vocabulary limits. I think this is the one that maybe needs the least amount of explanation, considering that um, we're in an event with people who are trying gold list method and chunking and close mastering and whatever. Um, vocabulary limits, I think, are the ones that are probably most easily addressed. Oh. Then finally, natural speech characterization. Um, Natural speech characterization is an interesting one because people think it stops at idioms. It doesn't. And finally, persistent fossilized errors. Um, Richards has a really great way of um, looking at this and also looking at Swain's research, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, persistent fossilized errors. Um, I make a lot of these in Russian. Um, I even still make some in German. Uh, and they're the trickiest to get rid of, and they're the ones that will leave you crying at night into your pillow. <laughs> so, and they're the hardest to get rid of, to be honest. Um, but there, there is a way to sort of crack it if you know why and how they still exist for that long. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's take a look at receptive and active use. Um, so Krashen, 1982, claimed that learners' productive ability will arise naturally from receptive knowledge. In particular, Krashen stressed that meaningful comprehension rather than focused production is all that is needed to facilitate language learning. And this is Richard's explanation um, from the Cambridge University Press in 2015. I thought it was a really elegant explanation of Krashen's research. And guess what? It's not necessarily true. We have something called anxiety dissonance, and we also have reverse translation asymmetry. A uh, reverse translation asymmetry, um, which is done by Kroll, um, Judith Kroll, who was my um, thesis advisor. Um, so I was part of the later of the later stages of this research. Um, reverse translation asymmetry is part of the revised hierarchical model. Um, and I'm pretty sure every single person in this room has experienced it. Um, when you read a word and you can translate it back, but you find it really hard to produce it. This reverse translation asymmetry will drive you crazy. And this is exactly one reason why it's not necessarily true that receptive and active use will help facilitate learning. Um, the other one is anxiety distance, which appears in some research from Fen Yi in 2007. And this basically says that reverse translation asymmetry, which is a feature of the gap between receptive and active use, that once you feel that gap and you feel the dissonance between those two, you'll start to feel a sense of anxiety, which may actually block you from learning. So when we have, for example, a teacher who is giving us some examples in the classroom, and we take in what they're saying to us. Maybe we have a speaking partner, and we take in what they're saying to us. We practice um, maybe what's in our textbook, or we listen to a CD 
Um, that's our receptive use. Um, and that might be fine, but then when it's time for you to speak, and it's time for you to repeat it back, or it's time for you to say what's happening using the words or the grammatical functions that were produced for you, and you can't do it, you start to panic a little bit. And then your brain starts to shut down, and then you feel more and more frustrated with yourself. And this is what Fan Yi's anxiety dissonance is. It stops you from being able to absorb new information. When the anxiety response happens, um, your body is producing, for example, adrenaline. Um, and you're also diverting your blood flow away from your brain into other parts of your body so that you actually produce a fight or flight response even if it's not necessary. Um, and this will actually keep you from having enough faculties to make executive decisions and to put new information into your short-term memory. And if you can't put it into your short-term memory, it doesn't become a long-term memory. You, you, it could. Exactly, because it doesn't allow you to retrieve it from your long-term memory either. It's kind of like brain freeze in a way. And it happens to varying degrees to different people depending on the situation. Some people have extreme anxiety of um, not being able to do something, and they might have classroom anxiety, and it might stop them to a much more extreme degree than someone else. Did you have a question? I think, yeah, it's true for whatever the level, um, and, but there's actually some research. Um, the research that Fen Yi is talking about is especially aimed at intermediate learners um, because they're a very vulnerable group when it comes to, they have a few skills, they have a certain small set of skills, and that gives them a set of confidence, but as they find out that there's still some things they cannot do, then that confidence gets knocked down, and it's that knocking down of confidence that makes it kind of a special point of um, difficulty or a special pain point for intermediates. But yeah, that's exactly, it is definitely true for every level. Um, so we have that, but there's something that will actually help with that, and um, we talk about the noticing hypothesis, and it's modeled on first language acquisition. Um, and with the noticing hypothesis, um, we say that the only linguistic materials that can figure in language making are stretches of speech that attract a child's attention to a sufficient degree to be noticed and held in the memory. So when you think about when you're learning your first language, you notice a word, or maybe even the first time you're exposed to your second, third, fourth language, you notice patterns. And when those patterns catch your attention, or a word catches your attention, it sticks in your brain. And that is literally and very simply the noticing hypothesis. Um, and that was pioneered by Sloten. Um, and that is also followed up by hearing and intake. So when you hear something that's modeled, and then you can take it in, um, there's a really great definition of intake uh, that is the only, uh, the intake is the part of the input that the learner notices and it's the basis of linguistic development and that's how Schmidt describes it. So it's very simply the thing you notice. The thing you notice is, is oh, what's that? I need to understand it. It seems a bit simplistic and a bit obvious, um, but this hearing versus intake is part of the noticing hypothesis. So once you notice something, you're going to be more primed to learn it. Then we have focused output hypothesis, which is also working in tandem with that. It's pushed output and managed output. Um, and Meryl Swain did some research about this and came up with this idea of when learners have to make efforts to ensure that their messages are communicated, which is pushed output, this puts them in a better position to notice the gap between their production and those of proficient speakers, thus fostering second language development. In her case, she was only working with second language development, but it could also work for third, fourth, fifth language development. Um, and it really also comes down to how you feel about that gap. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about in a little bit, is sort of your mindset or your growth mindset or if you find it hard to have a growth mindset about this. So if you hear a native speaker speaking and they don't sound like the way you would say it because you're still learning, you say, okay, well, 
it, that's different than what I'm going to say, but I should try to sound more like that, or I should try to say it more like that, or I should try to create a sentence that is more like what the native speaker is saying. And noticing how big that gap is, or maybe over time as you improve, it gets smaller, is part of this focused output hypothesis. Once you see the gap, you begin to manage how you say it. You say, okay, well, I need to use a different kind of grammatical structure here, or I need to use a different word. And you start to edit how you speak. And then it becomes managed up closer to what the native speaker would say. Um, the next point is the fluency versus complexity gap. The fluency versus complexity gap um, was researched by Van Patten. And um, it talks about restructuring. Restructuring is when you have a body of knowledge, for example, what is already existing in your brain, and then you learn some new things, some new grammatical structures, for example, or some new words, and you have to find a way to restructure that knowledge into your head. You have to find a way to integrate it into what you already know so that you can use it. So restructuring involves processes that mediate the incorporation of intake into the developing system. Since the internalization of intake is not a mere accumulation of discrete bits of data, so you don't just learn words one by one by one, the data has to fit in some way, and sometimes the accommodation of a particular set of data causes changes in the rest of the system. So those are the kind of aha moments you have where you learn something new, and it suddenly shifts your whole way of looking at what you knew before. In some cases, the data may not fit in at all and is not accommodated by the system. They simply do not make it into the long-term store. This is what you see happening when you learn something a bit advanced that's maybe a bit ahead of your curve. And you learn it, and maybe you kind of want to hang on to it, but it kind of doesn't make sense. It doesn't have any kind of space of reference or any context that you can really put it into at that point in time. You just know that it's kind of important, but you don't quite know how it works. Um, and this is that kind of data that doesn't have any frame of reference to be able to fit into. And then maybe somewhere down the line you have more context and that piece of information makes sense. Um, uh, the example is, for example, learning a new tense. So let's take the past tense, for example. You know the simple past, and then you learn something like the past continual. And now, what, all the time before that, maybe you were only using the simple past to describe things that were even continual. Now you have to restructure your whole way of looking at how to use the past to include the continual past. Um, and this kind of restructuring, it's reshuffling if you want to call it even, um, this is this fluency versus complexity gap that um, it will help you to create more complexity. Um, but it can also take a hit in your fluency as well. Um, the next point is vocabulary limits. So intermediates, again, not a hard and fast kind of rule, but 2,000 to 3,000 words is about the start of the intermediate group. Not a lot of words. It's not a lot of words. Um, you can actually learn 2,000 words in about 17 hours with some learning methods. So yeah, that shows the lowest threshold of your intermediate. Um, Yi Fan. Um, did this really great uh, study where they were looking at um, English learners, um, but it also held true for other studies later on that were done with non-English learners, that years one and two of the classes, the vocabulary was increasing about an average of 1,500 words per year, which is quite a lot. But then three and four of vocabulary was only increasing 250 words per year by average. Um, and this is kind of um, highlighting this idea of diminishing returns, which is something I'm also going to talk about in a minute. Um, but vocabulary limits are actually the easiest point to manage when you're an intermediate learner. We have all sorts of methods for learning vocabulary. We have repetition methods, closed methods, listing methods, connection methods. Um, we have like mechanical writing methods, all kinds of things. Um, and so this is probably the most easily managed um, area of pain for intermediate learners. Um, the next one is natural speech characterization. So uh, who has problems with idioms here? Anyone? Yeah, me too, me too, yeah. Um, idioms are natural speech characterization. Um, we talk about things like multi-word chunks, which is, for example, um, tags at the end of sentences, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> 
You know what I mean? Yeah? Yeah, those things that just make everything seem a little bit more natural and loose. Um, for example, uh, I studied Japanese for two years on my own and then five years at university. And I was relatively fluent by the time I went to Japan, but they never taught us any of these natural speech characterizations. We sounded extremely formal and extremely bookish and literary. And I had no way of sounding actually natural. And the first thing that hit me, like literally the first day that I was there, was hearing people using multi-word chunks or conversational routines and fixed expressions. And I had learned none of these, and, but I picked up on them eventually. Um, and I sort of thought to myself, why did they never teach us this at school? Um, and unfortunately, this is one of those things that falls into an area of intermediate learning that isn't always stressed in school or in textbooks or in other learning situations. Although it, is, um, it has been documented that it is one of the few things that actually gets picked up better in intermediates who have tandem partners. So if you're using a casual tandem partnering or say, for example, um, video classes or something like that. This is one of those areas that actually tends to get addressed more deeply. So if you're doing that, then you're getting these probably. Um, conversational routines and fixed expressions are larger than multi-word chunks. So they're those full sentence expressions. Um, for example, um, it's my treat isn't one of those. Um, and some of these often get picked up in the very early stages and some of them are a little bit more complex. Um, so these also, I, another phenomenon of intermediate language learning materials, and I'm sure some of you have noticed this, is that you have your textbook, but there's a huge plethora of books that are specifically about very specific areas of intermediate learning, like idioms or idiomatic expressions, or slang, or something like that. And these are exactly these kind of natural speech characterizations that don't really get fully integrated into the learning experience. It's just always something you have to learn on the side. And I think that's a bit of a travesty because it shouldn't just always be on the side. It's a fully, a fully functional feature of speech. Um, so we should be integrating them more into the learning process. And then finally, fossilized errors. Um, Lightbound and Spada in 2006 um, did a really great study about this. Um, and they finally came up with a formal definition of fossilization, which is the persistence of errors in learner speech despite the progress in other areas of language development. So those little mistakes that you just keep on making, well, where did they come from? Well, one of the reasons why they persist and they keep on persisting is because they tend not to affect the speakers being understood. If they really truly affected the way that you were understood by other people, somebody would point it out to you and you probably would have fixed it a long time ago. So you can sort of hobble along with it. And honestly, the speaker may be not be that consciously motivated to correct them all the time because they're still understood or they're still getting their point across. Um, so this is one of those things that is why it's so hard to get rid of them. Um, so it's a question of other people maybe feeling uncomfortable to correct you so precisely or to actually, um, for you to motivate yourself to say, okay, you know what, I really need to get rid of this habit. I really need to start working on this. Um, so this is usually one of the last things to disappear from people's um, language features of intermediate um, goals to improve upon. Um, yeah, so which way is out of the desert? Now comes the good stuff. Well, um, it's on the other side of the plateaus. Um, is anybody here currently in a learning plateau? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it sucks up there, doesn't it? Because you can see all the things that you're not doing. <laughs> but the view can be really informative, too. You can see everything. So it's on the other side of the plateaus. It's about pushing through those plateaus, which there's no magic bullet for that. It's just all about persistence. And getting yourself to understand that learning is not linear. It's not linear. It's not linear. I can't say it enough. Learning is not linear. And I say, yes, OK, there's learning that's linear learning. But language learning is not linear. It's a natural process. So let's get it out of our head right now that learning is linear when it comes to language learning, and especially not for intermediates. <laughs>
expectation management. Does anybody actually do active expectation management as part of your learning experience? Anybody? Oh, well, you should start doing it now because it really helps. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then key goals. Um, and key goals, they, it might sound, you hear about goal setting, but key goals are something that's kind of a bit of a more deliberate practice. So um, these are four strategies that we're going to use as more of an experiential technique um, to help get through a lot of these other um, problems like fossilized errors, limited vocabulary, and some of these other pain points that were more prescriptive that we just talked about. Um, so pushing through those plateaus. Well, the problem is, like I mentioned before, um, there's the law of diminishing returns, right? For example, like we saw with the vocabulary, as you've learned a lot of vocabulary in the beginning, and then as you go on, you learn less and less vocabulary, because wh guess what? You've learned the vocabulary. But the problem is, is that our expectations are that we're going to continue to have the same rate of improvement and the same rate of getting new vocabulary. It's just not sustainable. But it's only human that we continue to think that way. So it's a matter of being conscious about the fact that, hey, if you only learn 250 new words this year, that's not that bad because they're probably really complex new words. They're probably really low frequency but very high spe highly specialized words or words that will help you to create very native or complex sounding things or to talk about the specialized topics and typical topics. Um, so this idea of diminishing returns shouldn't be seen as something negative, but it's just a fact of life. And it's also a fact and a sign of progress. Um, and again, this deliberate practice of sort of recognizing these things is really important. Um, I, not only deliberate practice in terms of mindful learning about reminding yourself how far you've come and where you are exactly and what that means, but also deliberate practice in that every time that you sit down to study or every time that you sit down to practice, that you have a few very specific things in mind about what you want to achieve. A lot of people just decide, oh, I'm going to study a little bit today and they just go for it, and it's a bit free form. Nothing wrong with that. That should be part of everybody's learning routine, but not all the time, because then it's really hard to sort of get a feel with what you're actually doing. And after a while, you may say, what am I even doing? So it's good to have a few sessions of deliberate practice where you go in with a very specific and small goal, remind you, small goal, um, and also to come out so that after at the end of this kind of learning experience that you have, whether it's five minutes or an hour, you can actually stop and say, okay, did I achieve these things? And if you can tick them off your list, then you can definitely say that you've done something beneficial for your learning. Varied input. Who does the same routine all the time for learning? Anybody? Okay. There's a lot to be said for routine, definitely. Um, there's a reason why sports stars do the same thing every time before they go to play, right? They definitely want to get their head into the game. There's nothing wrong with that. But also varied input, not always studying the same vocabulary all the time, not always going through the same thing, not always, for example, never listening to a movie or listening to an audiobook or something like that. You have to have varied input. You have to have long sessions with short sessions. You have to look at newspapers. You have to watch cartoons. Um, try to keep it a bit interesting. Um, this varied input that will shock your brain a little bit. It's those brain shocks and that novel kind of stimulus that will help you to remember what you're doing. Um, and finally, connections and comfort zones. Um, con connections and comfort zones, I think for me, that sound, maybe it sounds a little woo-woo. But um, one of the things that really keeps me interested in language learning is making connections with what I already know. Um, for people who only know one other language, it could be about making a connection with their native language or even something that's entirely not associated with language learning. But as polyglots, we have other languages we can connect to. And those kinds of connections can be the things that will keep you from making errors constantly. Or it could be the thing that helps you to remember a word. And I'm sure we've all done this very unconsciously. But we need to also talk about this in terms of moving it out of our comfort zone. Can we make novel associations? Can we make connections that are very intricate or that help us to make a memorizing device? And we need to push ourselves out of those comfort zones of what we already know. Um, and I know these are all kind of psychological 
strategies to help us do these things. But this is why intermediates need a little bit of extra push when it comes to motivation. So language learning is not linear. This is one of the big mantras that I want us to all remember. Um, we don't learn our first language all the same way. Um, so why should we learn our second language all the same way too? Um, don't expect your progress to be linear at all. That's why the plateaus happen. The plateaus are totally natural. They're not an anomaly. They're not something wrong with you. It's just simply that our brain needs some time to accustom itself to all the new information that we have. And as we become intermediates and as we move along and away from beginners, this diminishing returns phenomenon will happen. And that's what those plateaus are. So expect your progress to be micro-exponential. This is the shift in mindset I would love everybody to try at least once in the coming weeks, is to think of it as micro-exponential. Exponential is in that nice hockey stick curve through the roof, but in a small way. It's a tiny, tiny hockey sticks. Super tiny hockey sticks. So if it means that you learn three really difficult words, that's a, that's a micro-exponential. You've learned three really difficult things really well, very small, tiny bites, but it's really delicious. <laughs> Identify your key goals. So we all have goals. I want to be fluent in French or something like that. But I'm talking about micro key goals. Key goals are in very specific things, very easily achievable things, things that you can focus on that are very clear, like micro habits. What happens when you're an intermediate? You often get discouraged. You don't feel like studying. Oh, I can't deal with this anymore. I just can't get past this one thing. Micro habits. If it means like just opening your book, you don't have to study. Just do the action of opening the book. Just do that. Take that first step and just do it. You might sit in front of it for like a minute. Give yourself a minute. You don't have to study, but you might find yourself wanting to study for a second. The book's already open. You might find your eyes straying down to that vocabulary list. And before you know it, you're studying. Micro habits. Keep it small. If you want to think about it, and if you want to keep, give yourself a mnemonic device, even though the group of intermediates is really big, you want to do everything on a small scale when you're an intermediate. Micro goals. Choose those tiny little things that you, always, oh, I always want to stop. I want to, I want to stop learning to, I want to stop making this mistake with the genitive or something like that. I don't know. Whatever these tiny little things, like just focus on a small thing because the feeling that you get from focusing on a small thing and really tackling it will help you to overcome this idea of, I don't know when this is going to end. Um, and then identify specific wants and needs. Um, one of the things that I tell my students is, is that they should keep a journal, um, not only about the statistics of what they've learned, but also how they feel about their learning and take the temperature of their emotions about learning. Because again, learning is a very emotional activity, right? We have all kinds of negative feelings associated with when we don't know something. But maybe this will help you to adopt a growth mindset so that when you don't know something, you don't feel so negative about it, but instead you feel like, I don't know this thing and I really want to know this thing. And you can sort of learn to push aside any kind of negative feelings that you have or turn them around into something positive. But I always find it really useful that on a regular basis, maybe once a week, to sit down and ask yourself, how do I feel about learning Russian right now? And it may not always be positive. It doesn't have to be. I know I have plenty of times I've asked myself, how do I feel about learning Russian right now? I hate it. <laughs> but you say, OK, great. Well, I've, I'm already feeling frustrated with it. That's going to color and flavor everything that I feel during my learning session. So you can take that into account. If you have a day where you feel like, oh, this is great. I'm loving it then you know, OK, great, I've got a lot of momentum here, but maybe that also means I'm overlooking a few things that maybe I need to be more careful about. So it's about being mindful, managing your expectations. We all have high standards for ourselves, but some of us are better at being kind to ourselves than others. Frankly, I myself am not very kind to myself. Um, so it's been a long, hard road for me to learn how to manage my expectations. Um, but if you can learn to manage your expectations, you can take an emotional learning inventory. Um, the exercise that I just described to you about asking yourself about how you are feeling before your learning session is part of the emotional learning inventory. Um, you can clearly state your key goals. Uh, 
So make sure that you know exactly the boundaries and parameters of what you want to learn. Don't let yourself suddenly snowball into having bigger and bigger goals that you may not meet immediately. And then you may say, I'm, I'm just not getting this fast enough. And then you get really frustrated and want to give up. Um, and track your non-metric process, your progress. Um, I know a lot of us, we keep notebooks or logs or spreadsheets of all the numbers of what we've learned, or we have apps that give us a dashboard that tells us how many words we've learned in a learning session and gives us a nice graph. Those are really motivating things. I definitely feel they have a lot of value. But what about your non-metric progress? What about this progress that you have about how you feel about your learning? I feel it's just as important. Um, and this is why I often tell people to you know, just make a few notes or just take a few moments during the day to think, of, think to yourself, how do I feel about this? I'm learning Korean right now, and I'm still at a very, very early stage of my learning, but it took me a really long time to learn Hangul because I wasn't really doing it in a very systematic way. If I had learned it earlier, I would have done it really systematically. But I've gotten older, life is happening, I, my brain is somewhere else, I've got other priorities, and I still want to do this thing, so I'm just going to have to learn to do it in a different way. And I sat down to track my non-metric progress the other day, and I realized, well, you know what? It took me maybe three times as long to learn Hangul as it did for me to learn Hiragana, but I've learned it in a way that was really organic and natural, and I didn't put pressure on myself, and I just let it happen in as, as quickly as it needed to happen, or as easily as it could happen for me. And I felt really good about that. It took me longer, but I felt great that I just let it happen the way that it could happen. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. So taking a look back, um, the prescriptive problems, receptive versus active use, um, the fluency and complexity gap, the vocabulary limits, natural speech characterization, and persistent fossilized errors. These are all kind of prescriptive problems that intermediates encounter. But we can also help to move beyond those things by talking about pushing through our plateaus. Um, reminding ourselves that, again, learning is not linear. Um, through expectation management and through defining key goals. And remember, keep it small, keep it simple, and keep it personal. And ask yourself every time that you sit down to learn, how am I feeling about this? Um, I know these are really tiny and small, but they'll be on my website, so if you want to look at these for further reading, um, uh, quite a few of them are available on the internet for free as PDFs through university systems. So you could actually sit down and read a lot of this research that I referenced. Um, and I want to say un grand merci, everybody. Thank you. Um, again, I'd like to thank Shedworks Games for allowing me to use these visuals. Um, and all my friends who have given me input, um, and all of you for listening to me today. Um, and if you'd like to have more information, you can follow this QR code. Um, and it will also um, give you an opportunity to give me feedback so that if there's anything that you'd like to tell me or questions or anything like that, you can go ahead and send that there. Thank you, Jennifer. We have time for a few questions. Hi, I'm Paul Doucette. Nice to, I, I, I really enjoyed listening to you. One Thanks. of the things that I've heard from a lot of really successful language learners mm -hmm. is, you know, making specific goals. And I imagine that the kinds of goals you make when you're, an, when you're like a beginner as compared to like when you're an intermediate or different, like I'm thinking I'm, I'm learning Turkish now. And mm -hmm. I think for me, an appropriate goal is today I'm going to learn the months of the year. In French, where I'm kind of a high intermediate, that would not be an appropriate goal. For me, probably would be something like I'm going to read five pages of difficult text and I'm going to, I don't know, look up 10 words. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I just want you to comment more on like how you make goals on the intermediate level versus other levels. Sure. Um, well, I can give you some examples of goals that I set for myself. Um, for example, I'm a big fan of self-scripting. Um, and I think self-scripting is a technique that works for any level, really. And it's just a matter of what kinds of scripts you want to achieve for yourself. Um, so I've, maybe an example of using self-scripting for a goal for a beginner would be like, I'm going to try to order a coffee. And you don't need to do it with anybody else. You just have to imagine the situation in your head. 
Um, and you have to sort of anticipate, okay, well, what would the server ask me? So you have to produce that language so that you know what the question is to start the task. Okay, well, how would I answer that? And you use what you have. Um, so don't try to write it down first. Try to really come up with it out of your head or at least to think of the words that you would use. So to find these key inputs and these key tools. So if you know the vocabulary for order and coffee, at least you can pull those out, and then if you need to look it up after that, you can use whatever references you've got. So building these small foundations. So first, using what you can pull out of your head that you know well, and then building on top of that by using references. That's a great one for beginners. If you're, say, upper intermediate, heading towards advanced, um, you can use self-scripting by saying, okay, like imagine somebody's interviewing me for a television show, and they're asking me about, um, I don't know, whatever, let's say they are asking you about your job and you need to tell them something very complex about your job. How would you explain it to them in a way that makes you feel confident and comes off very fluidly and that you feel like, hey, okay, I sounded like really confident by saying that. I think a, a lot of in intermediate learning is about imagination. So um, don't feel strange if you find yourself talking to yourself in the mirror because I do it all the time. So um, yeah. Oh, sure. Well, there's two. This one? Sure. Yes, Like, what are your thoughts on, you know, at an, at an intermediate stage, there's a lot of different things you can do, but I wanted to get your thoughts on the whole question of comprehensible input and just relatively large or massive amounts of content. So, like, you could spend some time learning some vocabulary explicitly, mm -hmm. Or you could try to listen to a lot of content or read a lot of content that's just kind of above your present level and try to pick it up automatically. Like, I don't know if that works for everybody. That's what I did with Spanish. I just, you know, I listened to maybe an hour of podcasts every day or mm -hmm. some other kind of content every day, and it didn't feel like work, so it was very enjoyable for me. And it kind of got me past that plateau in Spanish. But like, I wonder what your thoughts are on, because when you get to intermediate, there's there's so many different, th you're at a level where there's all these different approaches you can use. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like choice paralysis a lot of the time. And I think it really depends on your comfort level. And again, like I said, our comfort levels can change from day to day, right? Like when you're tired, you're just not really gonna have a lot of bandwidth to take in a lot of new information. So maybe you wanna keep it easy and low key, but then other days you feel really engaged and your neurons are popping. And you're like, yeah, I could, I could do something really hard right now. Um, I think, it, for me, for example, I'm not even close to intermediate with Icelandic, but I'm listening to Icelandic podcasts when I'm cleaning the house or something like that. And I think that you don't necessarily need to be actively engaged to, to receive comprehensible input. Um, but that just training your ear, it's like on those days where you just don't feel like taking in a lot of information or you feel a bit more passive, that like just training your ear to sort of be comfortable with what you're listening to and not necessarily understanding it all. Um, I think that still applies to a lot of intermediates. Um, and it, again, this is sort of the, the catch-22 of intermediates is that it's all so individual. Um, so this is why I often I am encouraging a lot of self-reflection about what your current needs and your current comfort levels are. Um, and this is, it takes a little bit of work and it takes a little bit of thinking and, you know, asking yourself, okay, how do I feel today? What do I feel I'm capable of today? How does this feel, like, in terms of how I'm feeling about my learning in the last week or the last two weeks? and looking at it from a very short-term perspective, a middle-term perspective, and a long-term perspective. Um, but I, I think that that's totally fine. That, like, if, you're, if you just wanna take in a lot of listening, even if you're not understanding only, tw if you're only just understanding 25% of it, that's still okay because there will be something you notice and then you will be engaging that noticing hypothesis. And if that's that tiny little finger hold you need to crack onto something, then it's totally worth it in the end. Okay. Oh, anyway. Okay, and I feel like I was going to cheat because I said I had two, but um, <laughs> I was just going to ask um, 
kind of when you asked who was intermediate and kind of like almost everyone raised their hand, do you find that people self-describe appropriately? Because I know sometimes like with Spanish, I've asked people, you know, are you, you know, what's your level? And they'll say, I'm, I'm intermediate. And then I say, oh, como estas? And they're like, uh, I can't do that right now. But then there's people who will perpetually describe themselves as beginners, but then I can have a conversation with them. They're like, oh, I'm just the beginner. Oh, I can't, you know. So do you find that people have trouble self-describing? And if I could sneak in a second. Um, is there anything you recommend that intermediate learners don't do? Like that would just are spinning our wheels and it's a waste of time that you say absolutely don't like listen to stuff in English describing Spanish grammar like if you're intermediate, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, well I'll, I'll tell you what you shouldn't do and this is pretty, I, I try not to be too like prescriptive in what people do and don't do. I'm like, I'm almost never gonna say don't do this except like don't beat yourself up because it's not worth it. Um, and don't be afraid of making mistakes, but you should already know this one by now because I'm pretty sure any language teacher or any language partner has been like telling you this forever. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, but don't, don't have, I guess, like, don't set too high expectations for yourself or don't set yourself up for failure. It'd probably be the most practical one. So uh, again, it's about having small goals, micro habits, those things that are achievable, especially with our busy lives these days and that there's always something else competing for our attention, whether it's our phone or stress from work or something like that. But uh, as far as self-reporting is concerned, self-reporting is always a bit of a murky area. As a researcher, we ask people for a lot of self-reporting, and self-reporting is fascinating because you get a lot of insight that you otherwise normally wouldn't if you ask if you are not getting self-reporting and you're just doing observatory data collection. Um, and when you get when you ask for self-reporting, they give you like little insights, or they say they give some details about their background that are actually really informative. But at the same time, self-reporting is very much uh, a thing that kind of, again, is sort of touching slightly on the ego. Like for people who are a bit self-conscious about where their level may be at, and I know I was, I'm was i definitely even now still a bit guilty of this with Russian because I studied it really hardcore in university for five years, and then I didn't use it for a very long time. And I feel like a lot of guilt and shame about it. And so I find myself actually under-reporting my level in Russian, and I find myself even actively avoiding using it because I'm really afraid that I will like do something to embarrass myself. So even the people who are preaching, we still have to do active work to get over this, right? Um, nobody's perfect. Um, and so, yeah, I think that self-reporting, it's, it, I guess you kind of have to really ask yourself, all right, like what am I so afraid of when it comes to like not reporting yourself? Because most people who don't self-report consciously in line with what their level is, they do it really consciously because either they know, they have a very conscious feeling of not being good enough or they have a very conscious feeling of like, uh, it's a breeze and they're a bit overconfident about it. And overconfidence and underconfidence are something that most people psychologically are a little bit aware of, but they can't articulate very like, um, very explicitly, um, but it also has to do with, again, these very prescriptive definitions of what intermediate is. And I think that that's actually something that the, um, the European framework has helped to sort of like wrangle in a little bit, um, or at least for the people who are conscious of it and use it. I think that's helped to help people get a bit of a reality check about their skills. Um, what they do with that is up to them, <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, self-reporting is always a problem. Um, again, this is why I, like for example, when people ask me about the languages I speak, I make a very big distinction between my passive, my passive skills and my active skills, because I may be intermediate for something, but I'm mostly passive intermediate. So yeah, big problem. <laughs> Thank Thanks everybody. Thank you, Jennifer.